however, uh, be very open to providing all the support that is necessary uh, to ensure that CFE is a success we all know it will be. Thank you. We now move to First Ministers. Before I do so, can I just acknowledge the brevity shown during the exchanges over the last few weeks? This has allowed more time for the backbenchers to participate. I know we are all keen for that to continue. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. You know, presiding officer, we always aim to please. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to carry forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. Uh, presiding officer, both the First Minister and John Swinney have said that Scotland pays 9.9 per cent of tax revenues into the UK and receives back only 9.3 per cent of public spending. That suggests that Scotland pays in more to the UK than we get out. Could the First Minister please tell me how much money is 9.9 per cent of tax revenue and how much money is 9.3 per cent of spending? First Minister. Yeah, the surplus of revenue over spending in that year was, in memory, £4 billion, and that contributes to a surplus over the last five years, a relative surplus compared to Scotland and the UK uh, of some £8 billion. Uh, that is, of course, the point of doing uh, the statistics, because the unionist parties, Labour, Tory, etc., have always wanted to say that Scotland has higher public spending. And, of course, that is true, and for very good reasons. But Scotland also contributes more in terms of revenue, and that's why taking the 9.9 per cent of revenue compared to the 9.3 per cent of spending, because it shows that Scotland is in a stronger fiscal position than the rest of the United Kingdom. Joanne Lamont. It's a classic First Minister. If you don't like the figures I give you, I've got another set prepared from earlier on. He didn't answer the question I asked him about the way in which he misrepresents those figures. According to his own JERS figures, 9.9% of revenue comes to £56.9 billion, and 9.3% of spending amounts to £64.5 billion pounds. So actually, Scotland gets £7.6 billion pounds more out of the United Kingdom than we put in. Isn't it the case, isn't it the case that if the Scottish Government's own figures show that we get more money out of the United Kingdom than we put in it, it is deeply misleading to try to give the opposite impression. First Minister. Order. First yes, Minister. Uh, due to a, a range of things, including the economic crisis, the vast majority of countries in the world have been running deficits over the last few years. There have been some exceptions, of course. Norway would be a grand example uh, uh, across the North Sea. Uh, but we have exactly uh, the figures of deficit between Scotland and the UK. 2008-9, Scottish deficit was 2.6%. The UK deficit was 6.9%. 2009-10, the Scottish deficit was 10.7%. The very height of the economic crisis, the UK deficit was 11.2%. 2010-11, deficit coming down, 8.1%. Scotland. 9.5% in the UK, and the last figures we have available, a deficit of 5% in Scotland compared to 7.9% in the UK. So for each of these last four years, the Scottish deficit is lower than the UK deficit. That is why we're in a stronger fiscal position. Of course, we don't get the benefit from that because the money is sucked into the maw of the London Treasury. Uh, and I, I've got to say, I, I, I mean, I really welcome this line of questioning, because we can actually put that into what the difference is. That is to say, the, the money that would have been available in, in each of, of these years. It would have been £6 billion in 2008-09, million in 2009-10, £1,993,000 in 2010-11, and £4,376,000 in the last year, making a total of over £12 billion. Pounds. Or to put it in terms that Joanne Lamont and I will appreciate, £2,397 for every man, woman and child in Scotland. That is what would have been relatively better off if Scotland had been running its own finances. Joanne Lamont. Order. 
Mr. In Lamont. all of that, in all of that, he didn't respond to the question I asked, which is, by his own figures, Order. we get more out than we put in. And the first minister should also recall, Order. should also recall that his own finance secretary, in his private paper to his cabinet, confirmed confirmed that Scotland will have a larger deficit than the rest of the United Kingdom by 2016, but of course that was for private consumption and not for the rest of us. Because if the First Minister could put down his statistical Tommy gun for a moment, randomly spraying out figures about questions he wasn't asked, it might have a little, we might get somewhere. I have asked him about two specific figures, quite simple. What Scotland pays into the United Kingdom and what the United Kingdom pays out to Scotland. Can he confirm that Scotland puts £56.9 billion into the UK in tax, as it states on page 598 of his own white paper? And can he also confirm we get £64.5 billion back as per page 68? These are his own figures. Can he confirm his own figures are correct and show that Scotland gets more back for the United Kingdom than we put in? First Minister. Well, I'm glad that Joanne Lamont has uh, cited the White Paper. It's in pages 72 to 76. And, of course, it shows, if I could just correct her, that Scotland's fiscal position in 2016-17, the first year of independence, will be stronger than that of the United Kingdom. Uh, I've tried to explain that in each of the last four years, Scotland has run a deficit. That deficit is much lower than the deficit being run by the United Kingdom as a whole. That means we're in a stronger uh, fiscal uh, position. Our finances have been stronger over the last four years. We didn't get the benefit of that because we're run from London. Now, uh, in terms of, of borrowing, uh, some of the many remarkable statistics, uh, uh, the uh, Better Together Head Alistair Darling, uh, combined with George Osborne, and that is a combination that's quite normal, uh, this pair between them have borrowed more than every other UK Chancellor in the whole of history. The UK borrowing has more than doubled in the period of office of Darling uh, and Osborne. That is the extent of UK borrowing. We would have been £12 billion relatively better off. And I don't say we could have spent all of that money, although some of that expenditure would have been very useful in the capital infrastructure of Scotland. It would have been sensible to borrow less than the UK has done over the last four years. So it would have been a combination of borrowing less and spending more, using that better position to power Scotland forward. So, We'd have a smaller deficit over the last four years than the UK. That is beyond doubt. Can Joanne Lamont not see that that translates to we'd have been in a stronger fiscal position? And for the people of Scotland, what that means would have been able to use Scotland's massive resources to benefit the people and the economy of this country. Joanne Lamont. It's an interesting sidelight. The First Minister has now denied what John Swinney said in its own private paper that we would have a greater deficit by 2016. But you know, I don't think any of us should take lectures on economics from a First Minister. Even a, even a, even a, Order. Even, a even a Royal Bank of Scotland economist who said in this chamber on the 28th of November. We get 9.3% of the spending, but we raise 9.9% of the revenue. 9.9% is greater than 9.3%. Even a primary school child could tell you it depends what the percentage big figure is of. It is not credible. Since the First Minister embarked on his referendum campaign, he has been making promises he claims he will deliver if Scotland votes yes. But his own figures show that there would be even less money to spend if Scotland votes to go independent. In the real world, where we look at the figures, where we talk in private as we do in public, that is a fact. Isn't it the truth that not only will the First Minister be unable to make good on those promises, he won't even be able to deliver on what we have right now? First Minister. Order. Say. First Minister. 
When Joanne Lambert started this line of questioning, I thought she really understood it, but was trying to make some political points. Now I'm beginning to think she actually doesn't know, understand this point. Yes, yes. 9.9%. Uh, as every school child and perhaps every former English teacher should know, is greater than 9.3%. And if you have 9.9% of the revenue... Nine, well, I'm sorry, Alec Johnston, 9.9% is greater than 93 If you have 9.9% of the revenue and 93 for the spending, you're better off. If it was the other way around, you'd be worse off. But luckily for Scotland... We've got nine. We've generated 9.9% of the revenue for 9.3% of the spending. That means we would have been running a smaller fiscal deficit than the rest of the United Kingdom, or we would have been in a stronger fiscal position. Now, Mr. Johnson, a stronger fiscal position in London is perhaps not too much. I mean, just about every other country in the world is in a stronger fiscal position. But it does indicate how we could have mobilised the natural resources of Scotland to maintain spending as well as borrowing less over these critical years. Now, we can't do anything about the last four years of these figures. That money is gone. But what we can do is take the lesson for the future, because in every single one of these years, when we were in a better position than that of the United Kingdom, and therefore would have had the freedom to invest in our economy, or to borrow less, or a combination of both, the Tory and Labour parties were never fond or end of telling people in Scotland how poor we are. The figures demonstrate we're relatively better off, we're in a stronger position. That is true in the last four years, it'll be true in the future. Isn't it high time? that we've mobilised these resources to benefit the people of Scotland. Yeah. number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, in next week's Secretary of Scotland, no current plans. Ms. Davidson. Thank you. On the 26th of November, the White Paper revealed the SNP's plan to jump the queue into Europe. It claims that they could go primarily through Article 48, instead of Article 49, Order. a route which no other state has used in the history of EU accession. Then, on the 12th of December, Nicola Sturgeon appeared before the European and External Affairs Committee and said, not once, not twice, not three or even four, but on five separate times, that nobody had questioned whether this was a valid legal route. Does the First Minister stand by that? First Minister. I'm, I'm delighted that Ruth Davidson is on to this point because it does uh, allow me to cite what can only be described, I think, as a, a, an impeccable source. Uh, that is the, the guru of the Better Together campaign. <laughs> Better Together's favourite academic, Professor Jim Gallagher. Uh, looking in particular Order. at this question of whether Scotland would have an accelerated position into the European Union, maintaining its position. Here he is in his blog of last year. So, for example, it seems pretty likely that Scotland would be an EU member state probably after an accelerated set of accession oh. negotiations. Hey. He goes on. Precisely what the conditions of membership would be is not quite so clear, though immediate requirements to join the Euro or the Schengen Agreement can surely be uh, avoided. If Dresser Jim Gallagher is saying that, the guru of the Better Together campaign, can't we just accept that the burden of opinion favours the position adopted by the government as opposed to the position adopted by the Better Together Alliance? Mr. Davidson. I'm glad that the First Minister brings up European writing, so I'd like to enter some of my own. But to go back to Nicola Sturgeon, she also told the committee, if you want to quote people who are saying that this isn't a legal route, I'm happy to engage in that debate. So I have here a copy of a new submission by Jean-Claude Perry, who is the former Director General of the Legal Service of the EU Council. And he's telling the committee, and I quote, it would not be legally correct to try and use Article 48 for the admission of Scotland as a member of the European Union. I am happy to put this entire submission into the public domain today so that everyone can see in black and white a leading European expert saying that the SNP's plan is not lawful. The First Minister misled the Scottish public Order. on EU legal advice. Ms Davidson, can we withdraw? That had previously been ruled on the last week before Christmas and was admitted, presiding officer. Um, did, do I misunderstand? What was wrong with that? 
I will correct the record by saying the First Minister was unadjacent to the truth in what he said on EU legal advice and unadjacent to the truth in what he said on our route into Europe. So I must ask, why should we believe anything that he says on this subject? First Minister. Well, let, let's just say that, uh, that uh, Ruth Davidson will, will cite her authorities and now uh, cite the, uh, my authorities, and we can have that argument. The, the significance of, surely, uh, Jim Gallagher's comments is not that he's had an opinion, but he is actually the star academic of the Better Together campaign. Just as the significance of Professor James Crawford's comments that it would be realistic the 18-month timetable for Scotland to negotiate its position from within the European Union, realistic is what Professor James Crawford says, that has a particular significance, not just because he's a, an important academic, but because he was paid by the UK government. So what I'd say to Ruth Davidson is the opinions I cite uh, from, uh, and I know it's embarrassing from uh, Jim Gallagher now, uh, and from uh, Professor James Crawford, these are significant and important because I am citing people who are either in the Better Together campaign or paid by the UK government. And if we get to the position that even they, and I know it's difficult for Jim Gallagher to be caught telling the truth in this matter because of his current position, but if even they are saying that, then I think the reasonable position that people will adopt, that people will adopt is that that is a profound and important contribution to the political debate. Question number three, Will Rooney. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, the matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will Rooney. Uh, I want to praise the Justice Secretary for acknowledging arguments made by opponents of the abolition of corroboration and for moving his position. But the solution he proposes is crackers. Can the First Minister think of another occasion when the Government has said, pass this law and we'll decide what to do later? Yeah. It's safe to vote for this because we'll fix it afterwards. Is he really expecting this Parliament to vote for this bill now? A bill that abolishes a great Scottish legal safeguard, a bill the Government says is incomplete, and a bill that is so bad that it will need fix later? First Minister. Well, <laughs> You know, I, I, I just thought that uh, in the first half of that uh, first bit of the question that Willie Rennie was continuing on his theme of, uh, of uh, sweetness and light and seeing the sense and accepting uh, uh, concessions when, the, uh, when they're offered. You know, I thought the Justice Secretary made some very important points. That corroboration, we believe, and I think there's support from other parts of the Chamber as well, as I understand it, shouldn't be a general principle. Why shouldn't it be a general principle? because it prevents some cases getting to court. It prevents some people getting their day in court because it's a general rule of corroboration. Uh, and that seems to me an important thing to put forward. But then to say that many people are concerned about safeguards and the security of that change, and therefore there could be a study of that to give people certainty, seems to me a, a, a genuine attempt to bring everyone together. So perhaps Willie Rennie would get back to the first bit of his question, uh, and accept that the Justice Secretary was doing his best while putting forward the importance of not having that the prosecution authorities of Scotland and therefore the public of Scotland not getting justice by that general rule. He was making a, a gesture to say, can we consider to see if there are safeguards that will sat satisfy an even wider canvas? Will there any? The First Minister knows I like to be reasonable when we agree. But for something so fundamental to be dealt in such a cat candied fashion is something I could never agree to. And this has happened before. This government forced through the centralisation of the police only for the chief constable to recommend fresh legislation within months. The government tried to rush through its sectarianism bill only to backtrack within 20 minutes. Have we really got to go through this again? A justice minister dancing in circles, begging for ways to fix his bill in the full glare of the committee. Isn't that enough evidence to show the First Minister that he has got it wrong in corroboration? What else does he need? First Minister. I may make two serious points. I mean, I, I, Willie Rennie asked me if there were, uh, uh, there were previous examples, uh, and now in his second bit of his question, he, he's now cited what he thinks are, are, are two previous examples. I'm not sure how the first and second questions tie together, but let's get to the substance of this issue. And I want, to, I want to bring 
Again, the, the, this chamber's attention to the Lee Cyrus case, uh, where some people in this chamber, some members, sitting not far from uh, uh, Willie Rennie at the present moment, demanded to know why that individual could not be prosecuted for suspected crimes in Scotland. And the Crown Office had already said because of the general rule of corroboration. And that person, sitting two away from Willie Ray, demanded to know from the Justice Secretary why that wasn't possible, and got uh, an answer. And that is the difficulty of that general rule of corroboration. It means that cases do not get into court. That is the difficulty. That denies justice, potentially, from many, many people in Scotland, particularly in sex crimes, particularly women, who cannot get access to that justice because of the general rule. That's real cases, real people, real difficulty. Yes. And I think to draw attention to that difficulty and to propose a solution, as the Justice Secretary is doing, is exactly the right thing. What I can't take from members of this chamber and anyone else is people who demand to know why a case can't get to court and then who refuse to support proposals being put forward to sort out that injustice. Being denied justice, as people are at the present moment, is as much, and I say as much, uh, 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 an important issue uh, as the possible miscarriage of justice. And if the Justice Secretary can bring forward proposals which make sure that people have access to justice <coughs> and can satisfy people yeah. that the danger of miscarriage of justice can be alleviated and can be stopped, then surely that would be something that any reasonable person and particularly the victims of crime, would want to see this Parliament support. Question four, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Treasury announcement that will honour all UK Government debt up First to the date of the independence referendum. First Minister. Well, I, I welcome the fact the UK Government are coming to terms with uh, reality, uh, recognising if you issue debt, the debt piled up by Alistair Darling and George Osborne, then you've got the legal responsibility for it. Uh, and with this announcement, the, the Treasury has finally endorsed the common sense approach set out by the Fiscal Commission a year ago that we outlined on pages 348 to 350 of Scotland's future uh, last November. Now, so perhaps we're beginning a trend here. Now we've had this common sense acceptance of the points we've been putting forward for the last year by the Treasury. Perhaps that will, who knows, spread to other areas uh, of current uh, dispute, like the European Union or other matters. So let's see this outbreak of common sense and carry it forward. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for his response and for reiterating that Scotland is willing to take its share of the UK's debt and liabilities following a yes vote. Will the First Minister join me in calling for the No campaign to exercise more of this newfound common sense in its approach to specifically regarding the formation of an optimal sterling currency area if Scotland votes yes? First Minister. Yes, I would, and I think uh, there are very substantial reasons. The point we put forward in the Fiscal Commission report and in the White Paper is not that we believe just it's in the interests of Scotland to have that sterling area, but it's in the overwhelming interests of the rest of the United Kingdom as well. And I saw a, a, an opinion poll uh, uh, in between the Christmas New Year which actually asked the people of the rest of the United Kingdom their opinion. And there was an overwhelming majority of the rest of the United Kingdom who believed that after Scotland was independent, it would be common sense to share sterling as a currency. Jenny Mara. To government debt, a new definition of pound sterling in Scottish government contracts with business now reassures contractors that they will be paid in sterling if Scotland ends up with a different currency. Now, the First Minister is prepared to reassure business that they will be paid in a stable currency, but will he give the same assurance to pay pensions in sterling in the event of independence? Why should people... Why should people who have paid sterling into their pensions over many years have their pension devalued by Salmon's new currency? First Minister. Well, the answer, the, the answer is yes, because we are going to retain sterling as our currency. Number five, Ken McIntosh. To the First Minister, what the Scottish Government's response is to advice given by academics on tuition fees for students from EU countries. First Minister. Well, I'm aware, of course, uh, the claims being forward, put forward by academics together, who are, of course, entitled to their views, but, but it should be noted they're campaigning for a, a no vote, so perhaps these views are of no great surprise. But I'm also aware, crucially, of the legal opinion provided to University of Scotland, a, a body, let's agree, of impeccable neutrality on the concept of independence. And, of course, that legal opinion makes it clear that EU law allows for objective justification 
where there is clear evidence of exceptional circumstances. And that is the uh, position that we have outlined. And I think, in fairness, uh, rather than cite one, two sides of the debate again, either if you are citing one side of the debate, as in the case of Jim Gallagher, for, for, in favour of our position, or alternatively, if you cite positions that have been taken by neutral bodies, then that must carry some weight. And I am sure that Ken McIntosh, in fairness, will want to reflect that. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the First Minister for his answer? And can I ask him to further clarify a more immediate and pressing question? For more than three years now, his Cabinet Secretary for Education, Mr Russell, has been trying to secure an arrangement whereby he can charge EU students currently stand, uh, uh, studying at Scottish universities uh, and therefore to recoup some of the tens of millions of pounds this is costing the Scottish Government. Can I ask the First Minister if he is still actively pursuing such a policy? First Minister. We are still uh, looking at, at the policy, but of course the important aspect that we recognise is that the policy that we are outlining in the White Paper and of course was supported by the legal advice given to University of Scotland for objective justification seems to us to, to set out a, a, a route whereby we can retain free education uh, in Scotland. Because you see, our objective is to maintain free education in Scotland. Now, I know that is not the objective of the Tory party. The Liberals went along with it south of the border in England. And the Labour party, I think, are now against the free tuition for Scottish students. Or I think Joanne Lamont wants to introduce a, a backdoor tuition fees, despite Ian Gray ruling it out at the last yes. election. So if Ken McIntosh will accept, our priority, our overwhelming priority, Success noted by the record numbers of Scottish youngsters at Scottish universities last year. Our overwhelming priority as an SNP government is to make sure that tuition in Scotland, the access to education, is based on your talent and ability and not your checkbook. It will remain free under the SNP. Well, Smith. First Minister, if the legal experts turn out to be correct and the Scottish Government would not be permitted to charge rest of the UK students fees, could the First Minister explain what the annual bill would be to Scottish taxpayers uh, in light of the commitment that is made in paragraph 236 of the White Paper, which says that there will be free higher education in Scotland? First Minister. Yeah, but we have explained it in the White Paper, following up on the legal advice provided to University of Scotland, why we think objective justification would allow us to continue with the present policy in Scotland. And interestingly enough, uh, I have been copied into a letter from University of Scotland to a newspaper clarifying that they do not disagree with the Scottish Government on this issue, and furthermore, repeating the welcome they gave to the information in the, the White Paper. Now, I would ask that the member to cast her mind back. Uh, to only a couple of years ago, when the Conservative Party were telling us that the policy that we were pursuing of free education in Scotland would run into to problems from south of the border. Well, I, I see the member nodding. Does she not recognise that the Conservative Party who claimed that universities in Scotland would bank not to be proved wrong? Because universities in Scotland are in a fundamentally better position than those south of the border. And that that policy, the policy we pursue, wasn't tenable. I've also been proved wrong because that policy of free education in Scotland is what is taking place right now. Now, if the Tory party were in control of the Scottish Parliament, well, that's obviously not going to happen in terms of control of the Scottish <laughs> Parliament. But if the Conservative Party ever got themselves anywhere near power in Scotland, no doubt they would want to put an imposition of £9,000 or more on every Scottish student. Thankfully, the SNP is in power in this Parliament, which is why tuition will remain free with the SNP. Question 6, Alex Johnson. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government aims to use the planning process to prevent unconventional gas production. First Minister. The, as with uh, proposal for all types of energy projects, any applications for coal bed, methane or shale gas projects in Scotland require to be considered on their merits and in accordance with the appropriate regulatory regimes and planning legislation. That is the due and proper process. Now, as a country with enough uh, oil to, to meet our, uh, our demand many, many times over, it is perfectly reasonable, I believe, to proceed carefully on the undoubted opportunities that there are for shale gas in Scotland. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, however, the Minister does have form on using the planning policy in, 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 in controlling energy. He used it to prevent the in investment in new nuclear in Scotland by threatening to use planning policy. And he's used it to cover our hilltops with wind turbines. So as he mobilises his resources, is he going to avoid 
a spectacular hat trick of own goals. First Minister. Well, two things. Firstly, as the member should know, if we established an expert group last September in terms of looking at the science of uh, an evidence-based approach in terms of fracking and unconventional uh, gas. Uh, and in October, of course, we announced, uh, CEPA announced important planning guidelines. So we're making the preparations to try and give a security and confidence to the people of Scotland that such resources would be developed in an environmentally safe and satisfactory way. Now, I can only contrast with what that's happening elsewhere, because the damage that's been done in terms of development surely was epitomised by George Osborne's father-in-law, Lord Howell of Guildford. If you remember, he claimed last year that fracking was OK for the desolate northeast of England. <laughs> he then corrected it by saying it was OK for the desolate northwest eh, of England. And if the member could just imagine what that message that conveyed to communities, whether in the northeast or northwest of England. And that is why I believe there's such a lack of confidence south of the border, and where, if they're not very careful, they'll spend more time in planning inquiries than they will actually extracting any gas. Far better to proceed in the scientific basis that the Scottish Government is proving with our planning legislation which is drawn up to make sure that any such development can be done in a responsible and safe manner. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Given that there is no direct link between the site of these developments and the extent of the geological structures which give rise to environmental risk, surely there can be no safe buffer zone for such developments. And the only way to achieve environmental protection is for the First Minister to unequivocally say fracking and unconventional gas have no place in Scotland. First Minister. Well, I know that Patrick Harvey will have noted the comments of Friends of the Earth Scotland and WWF Scotland, who gave a welcome to the Scottish Government's announcement. And it seems to me seldom that Patrick Harvey <laughs> departs from these particularly important pressure groups. But I think the point of view we're putting forward is pretty reasonable. The scientific analysis, I think, is important, because I think that's an essential preparatory step. And the, the guidelines fit for purpose, specifically designed for this potential development are another source of reassurance to people. And surely eh, to proceed in that careful and orderly and safe and scientific way is a much, much better way to proceed than either the helter-skelter desolate northwest of England as, uh, as provided by the Conservative Party, or for that case to say that there is no chance of these resources being developed in a safe and satisfactory way. Surely the evidence-based approach that the government is taking is a profoundly good way to proceed. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to uh, Mr Findlay, a point of order. Thank you, President Officer. I wonder if you could uh, provide members with guidance on parliamentary language. I'm sure if you do a basic search of the words misled or misleading, it will show that they have been used dozens of times in this session, whether in the committee or in the chamber. And indeed, in yesterday's health debate, the word misleading was also used. Can you advise us on how the rules will be applied consistently uh, to all members and whether the word mislead, misled or misleading is indeed correct parliamentary language. Can I just say to Mr Findlay um, that there are no set um, guidelines on what is and what is not parliamentary language. The judge of whether it is parliamentary or not at any particular occasion is mine. We now move to uh, members. members' business. Members should leave the chamber, should leave so quickly and quietly. <laughs>